When I first came to Calvary, I, intentionality hasn't changed all that much. I think the way it's portrayed or the way it's shown has, but, you know, again, I came to Calvary because the Word was intentionally taught. Home fellowships were important, and we still do the same things. Now we come to small groups, so what we do, you know, they're, they're something a little different, but they still have the same core. The fact that we even have this new building, and with the intent of using it for the glory of God in the community so that we can reach people with the gospel. I feel like the overarching motivation is to be like Jesus and one of those ways is to serve like him as well and to be intentional and to be loving and not to have a hierarchy over people um, when the world wants to create hierarchies but being able to serve and bend the knee to, to those that need it at, at that time. Well, I want to share on values. Uh, last week we started this. I'm going to just go over them. First, let me start with a kind of a definition. When we say values, what do we mean by that? The definition of values would mean these are like guiding principles that shape culture, they shape behavior, they shape our decision making. In other words, values are not necessarily the things that you say, right? You can, like, you can work at a, at, a, at, a, at a corporation that says, like, we're all about people. But then you work there and you're like, I think you hate people. It, you're really all about a profit, right? But you say you're, a, so the value is not what you say, but it's the undercurrent of what's really going on. Okay. And so whether we are intentional to express and communicate our values or not, they exist. And what we're talking about here at Calvary San Diego is not, this is who we are, we're all of these things. No, because we're in Christ, we say, this is who we hope to be in Christ Jesus. We're not these things, but we want to keep growing in this direction. Everybody's growing in a direction, right? Even if we're unintentional, we're growing in some direction, right? If, I'm, if, we're, if we don't choose that path, it'll be chosen for us one way or the other. So... I'm just going to briefly put these on the screen, the various values that we've established and are working into the process of our lives here at Calvary San Diego. You know, every time you walk through that center, if you avoid the center, you won't see it. But if you walk through the center, they're on the screens there. Because we just want this to be in us and a part of us. The values that we've established that we are asking God to make us are number one, relational. There's no order, by the way, but just this is how they are in my, on the screen. Relational, missional, kingdom-centered, intentional. We value the importance of the word of God and we value being over doing. And we haven't gotten to all of these. Today's just week two. And today we're going to cover two of the value elements. We're going to talk about what do we mean when we say intentional and then we're gonna talk about what we mean when we say kingdom-centered. I did a series not long ago called The Means to the End on the Kingdom of God. So combining these two is not difficult. I'd like to start with intentionality. How many of you speak a second language or maybe a third language? It's okay. You can boast about it. It's all right. You're allowed to. You can look down on everybody else. It's okay. You can do that. Enjoy that moment. You get that. You earned it. When Joy and I first moved to Hungary, we were trying to learn the language. And it was, let's just say, difficult. And, uh, but you know, you start like, uh, you start learning, you start, we took tutors, we, 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 we hung out at a lot of um, orphanages where the kids love to teach you things. Now, they don't teach you any good words, they only teach you bad words. I learned as a pastor to swear really good in Hungarian before I knew how to say, hello, how are you? You know, uh, all the kids were having a great time, like, say this, you know, and I'm like, okay, like an idiot. And I'm saying stuff, and the teacher, the adults, like, don't ever say that again. <laughs> you know, like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. You know, and uh, I can't tell you how many times I accidentally said one word and thought I had said another word. And I would say something super excited, and everybody would go, oh, no. Or they would laugh, or they would kind of like do that embarrassed walk away, you know, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe he just said that. 
Most of the time, these accidental mistakes created a bond with other people. I'd say something, and they would just laugh, and then they would say, that's not how you say it. This is how you say it. Joy and I, when we, we had a tutor, she was, uh, her and her husband were our closest friends, and she was tutoring us, or at least she tried. She really tried. She gets an A for great effort. Um, we beat her down. We beat her. We taught her that she couldn't teach us. We were unteachable. But uh, she was like teaching us words, you know, and, and, and we're learning like animals and all these different things. And I don't know how it happened, but as we were, we learned the, the word for snail, super unimportant in all languages, absolutely unnecessary, but somehow we, we learned snail, and then we learned the word for slug. And the word for snail is the word, I'll just say it, it's the word chiga, it'll mean nothing to you. But then the word for slug was, it, it was mestelen chiga. And we're like, hey, we know, it's a snail. What's mestelen mean? They said, naked. <laughs> a slug is a naked snail in Hungarian. We tortured our poor teacher for months and weeks when every sentence she would ask us to repeat, we would end with naked. <laughs> We just thought we'd learn the most fun word ever. I am walking down the street, naked. And we just thought it was so fun. And she's like, if you keep doing that, you're going to accidentally say that in public and you are going to get it. And I'm sure I did a million times. Listen, we all make mistakes accidentally. If it's not a language thing, it's a this or a that. We all do those things. You know, the worst kind is when we do it on purpose. We don't really want to do that, right, in life. We want to learn to be intentional in the right directions. When we say intentional here at Calvary San Diego, we're saying this, that God wants you and me to flourish in Christ on purpose. You know, they say, like, there's that phrase, you know, even a, bloke, a broken clock is right twice. We don't want to live our Christian life like that, do we? We don't want to live with, like, well, we'll just try and we'll see what happens. But no, we want to learn to flourish in Christ on purpose. In fact, in the Bible, we use this word, you've, you've heard this word, it's a great hippie word, peace, but in, in, in the Bible, the word shalom. And the word shalom means to flourish. It means a flourishing. When the when Bible used the word peace, it didn't just mean chill, but it also meant that God intends for you to prosper and to flourish. And so when we say intentional, we say God made you and God saved you for flourishing. Sometimes life is survival. Amen? Not amen. We hate that, but it's true. Right? Sometimes life is survival. Sometimes the Bible says like it does in Ephesians 6, Stand, therefore, against the attacks of the enemy. But oftentimes, our lives are meant to be an intentional decision to go after the heart and will of God for our flourishing, not just for survival. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Paul wrote, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. You see, ultimately, our, the, 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 the idea of being intentional means I recognize that my service, my identity, my value, as we spoke about last week, must come from God. If you weren't here with us last week, you need to go back and listen, watch, however you consume. Because we talked about what relational means. And relational doesn't mean happy chipper personality, but that I get my source of identity and value from God who is in relationship with one himself, Father, Son, and Spirit, and with humanity. I understand my value not from what somebody else ascribes to me, but from what God has said about me and what he ascribes to me. Now, I don't want to be weird about this because sometimes we can make it sound like it's one or the other, right? Like, it doesn't matter what anybody says. It only matters what God says. And then we go out and we're jerks for Jesus. 
And so we go with jerk for Jesus and we're like, it doesn't matter as long as I'm pleasing God and God's screaming from heaven, I'm not happy either. The goal isn't to offend everybody and be like, but my father in heaven is happy. Friends, that's not, in fact, the Bible tells us, in as much as it is possible, be at what? Peace with all people. You know, we don't go after. So, but, but here's the difference. Here's the difference between what I'm saying about relational, that I'm sourced in God. I'm not saying nobody else's opinions matter. No, no, no. What I am saying is this. First and foremost, I receive who I am from God. It is a, it is a joy to be in relationship with other people, but first it's sourced in God. I'm learning about who I am from God. But also, I'm learning about God from you. Sometimes in good ways, sometimes not so good. And that's true of all of us. But to be intentional, well, let me read Jeremiah 29, verse 11. What a famous verse, but speaks to intentionality. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They're plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Did you know? I think you did, but it's so good to remind ourselves. You ready? God has an intentional plan for your life. Can I say that again with a little bit more enthusiasm? Yes. God has a plan for your life. And it is for a future and a hope. God is not looking at you and being like, well, you know, you've been mediocre, so my plan's mediocre. He has a plan for your life. And our whole purpose, can you understand? Our whole purpose is to just get into his future and hope for my life. It's to just put myself in that, in that purpose. My whole, my whole thing is to say, okay, God, what is, the, what is it? And it keeps changing. It does not the same forever. Whatever God has you in today, listen, young moms with, I see moms with babies on the sides. I see you. We, see, we know you're in the back. We know you're probably at home trying to watch right now. You're like, will this season ever end? It will. And there's a whole bunch of other people in the room that will say, oh, it's going to end and it's going to go so fast. And you're like, really? Do you promise? <laughs> and then they're saying, oh, no, it goes so fast. Don't miss it. Don't you miss it. It's going to go. Da, 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 da. Listen, we're all in our season. And then when it ends and your babies are growing up and they're going off and you're like, oh, no. Oh, no, no. Let's have no regrets about whatever season. Just be in the season you're in. Be in it. Flourish in the moment you're in. And you're like, the moment I'm in is exhaustion and hunger. I'm just feeding. I'm just taking care of other people. Just be in it. It won't be, it won't be like that forever. And, and, that's not the, listen, the hope isn't it'll end. The hope is this. God is present in every moment of it. God is present in your loneliness. God is present in your joy. God is present. We need, listen, you want to know what intentional means to flourish in Christ? It means this, be present in every single moment. Not easy to do. We even coined a phrase for it in the work, in the work world, T-G-I-F. Let's just get to Friday, baby. Let's just get it over with. I get it. I understand it. I'm not against the sentence sentiment, but ultimately as Christians, God has something more. We are meant to communicate intentionality with each other. Let me just make a little plug here, a little commercial. Not really, but it fits to the thing. Gosh, if you're in a season of hardship, a difficulty, you need somebody to pray with, to talk with about these things, pick up the phone and call the church. Oh, I couldn't reach anybody. Use social media. Send a pigeon. Whatever. You'll find a way. Reach out. Reach out. If you're going through, you're like, oh man, I'm going to be at the, or gosh, I'm in, my, my, you know, I'm in the hospital, and I wish somebody would come and pray for you. Great, call. We'd love to. I think something happens, and this is kind of particular to the Christian world. We all, it's, it exists all over the world, but especially in our Christian world. Let me just say this. The times we need people the most are when we are kind of, it's a hardship, it's a hard moment. And guess what we feel like doing the most when we're in a hard moment? Leave me the heck alone. We isolate ourselves. The very moment we need people, we isolate ourselves. And then we isolate ourselves. And then we start thinking this, why is nobody reaching out to me? 
Some of you are thinking that I'm talking about a conversation I had with you recently. I'm not. I've been doing this 30 years. I can't tell you how many times this happened. This happens to all of us. Come on, show of hands. You ever felt like that? Like you, you're hurting and you kind of isolate and then you're like, where's all my friends? And you're like, I don't have any friends. I'm all alone. Well, let me try to paint this into a picture that I think we can understand. When you sprain your ankle, did you wait for the doctor to call you? Hey, I just had a feeling you might have hurt yourself. No, you don't. You hobble your sad self over to the doctor. You get somebody to take you there. Oh, I broke my wrist. I hope the doctor reaches out. Bro, he ain't calling. You have to be a simple word. You ready? You just have to be intentional. You have to say, I'm not doing well. I need to go see someone who could be a part of helping. The sad reality is, is that the devil loves to feed that, that thing in our head that says, you're alone. I'm just telling you right now, you're not. But you will be if you choose to be. It's the law of intentionality. If I want to, I can consume, I can convince myself that I am all alone. Elijah did it in the Bible. God, I'm the only one left. I'm the only prophet. All the prophets, all the people of God have abandoned you, God. I'm the only one left. You know what that sounds like? It's a weird version of depression and a weird version of arrogance. I'm the only one. Gosh, when I was hurt, when, when, when you were hurting, I really reached out to you, but boy, nobody's reached out to me. And, I, and you just feed a narrative of isolation and the devil is so happy when you do that. Nobody's reached out. Hey, friends, I want you to be intentional. I mean it with all of my soul. When I say this to you, pick up the phone and call. Nobody answered. Leave a message. We'll check it. Call somebody else. Call a friend. Give people an opportunity to be a part of your moment. Give them that opportunity. I want to move on to what it means to be kingdom-centered. To be kingdom-centered in, our, in our, our kind of the short phrase of this is simply, it's this, King Jesus over everything else. I want to get to talk about that. I want to get to talk about that with them, some opportunities God's given us here in the church. I want to talk about it. I want to talk about the Olympics. Anybody seen the, the little hubbub about the Olympics? Okay. Oh, yeah. If you haven't, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about it in just a minute. This is what we've written about kingdom-centeredness. We believe in the transformative power of the Holy Spirit and the central role of Jesus in his kingdom in our lives. Our focus extends beyond being church-centered. We want to have a kingdom-centered perspective. We recognize our local church as a conduit to the kingdom of God. My, my point is this. The point is this. Calvary San Diego is not the end destination. That's the whole point. And I know it sounds easy to say that, but it's, it's true. And that comes at a price. It comes at a price that most people don't understand or want to pay, and that means this. We here at Calvary San Diego are going to be, and again, everybody can say it, and a lot of people, we, these values are not ours alone. We are not the originators. We are not the owners. We are, this is just important to us. We will value the kingdom of God over everything else. That does not mean nothing else matters. I'm going to clarify that in just a minute, but I want to rephrase what I just said, and then I'll clarify this idea. So here at Calvary San Diego, we will be intentional to make the kingdom of God our top priority over and above everything else. Someday the name Calvary SD will go bye-bye. But the Bible tells us that the name of Jesus will be forever. We want to be Jesus people. I, am, I do not despise Calvary San Diego. I kind of like it. As it relates to the kingdom of God, not separate from the kingdom of God. May there never be a kingdom that I own. And may all kingdoms I take control of die. 
so that the name of Jesus and his kingdom would reign, because it will. Listen, whether I, I can say, oh, I don't want my kingdom to reign. My kingdom won't reign. That's the point. Oh, I don't want it to be about me. It won't be about me, so I better get on board with that right now. Oh, and what happens is, and I hear this a lot lately, it's a new kind of dynamic that we're hearing a lot. And it's this, it's this kind of like, it's this push against those of us that say, I want to be gospel-centered, kingdom-centered. There's this push. And the push is this. Oh, hey, I, there's a lot of people saying it's just about the gospel. And so it's not about it. They don't care about anything else that's happening. Well, they're not care about what the, the social dynamics, the racial dynamics, the economic dynamics. They don't care about what's happening with immigration. They don't care about elections. They don't care about all these things. And it's this it's this, it's this subtle, well, no, it's not. It's this not so subtle desire to tell you that people that say we're going to be about the kingdom don't care about anything else. Baloney. Do you remember, long way to answer this question, do you remember in the Bible when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up onto the mountain and then it says that he was transfigured, he was, he was revealed, right? He was, he was, his glory was revealed and he was there and Elijah was there and Moses was there. And Peter wakes up from a sleep. Now there's a common theme in the life of Peter pre-resurrection. He falls asleep at the worst moments Sleeping in a boat, sleeping on the mountain when Jesus was transfigured, sleeping when Jesus said, pray for me. That's the worst one of them all. If I went up to my buddy Nick and I'm like, please pray for me, and he literally went into a, oh, oh I'd be like, yo, just wait till I'm gone. I mean, come on. Right? I mean, could you imagine that? So Peter wakes up from a sleep and he sees Jesus transfigured and he sees Elijah and he sees Moses and he says, we should build three shrines to each one of you. And right at that moment, a voice from heaven spoke, God the Father. And God the Father spoke, and you can read about this in the gospel account. God the Father spoke and he says, this is my son. Listen to him. In other words, yep, super cool about Elijah, super cool about Moses, but this is the one you listen to. So what I am saying is this. When you and I prioritize the kingdom of God over all things, that does not mean nothing else matters. It means everything matters in priority. First, the kingdom. What does Matthew 6, 33 say? Seek first what? Kingdom of God. And what? All these things will be added to you. You know the problem with going after all things? You miss the kingdom. But if you start at the kingdom of God, all these things will be... It's not true that if you care about the kingdom, then you won't care about anything else. It means if you care about the kingdom, you will see everything else within its scope and within its priority. And so that we won't freak out at everything that happens around us. And we will at the things that we do need to Philippians 3.20, great verse. We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. We eagerly wait for him to return as Savior. We're citizens of heaven. I, I'm not trying to convince you of that. I'm telling you that's true if you're a believer. I don't want to convince you of something that is true. When uh, we are our oldest we had the great privilege, Joy and I, of adopting our, our daughter. And uh, when we were in Hungary, we were, you know, um, you, you had, had to, this is a long time ago. So we had a visa for her in order to enter America. But then upon entrance, she became a U.S. citizen, right? That's just the, the way that the process was working at that time, right? So we were sitting down and we're like, you know, first trip to America. We're going to be going soon. We didn't get out very often. So this was like a big thing, you know, and so... We're telling her, hey, you know, you're going to get to see, you got a whole bunch of family and, and cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents. Everybody loves you. Can't wait to get to meet you, you know. Um, and, she, and, and her response was, but I'm not American. I'm a Hungarian. And, I, and we were like, yep, you are Hungarian. But why do I have to go to America and then get an American passport? And I said, let me explain. Your dad is cheap. I am not going to pay for a visa every time we try to come out. <laughs> 
<laughs> so you're going to get the passport. She's like, yeah, but I'm Hungarian. You are Hungarian. You're Hungarian. No question about it. Well, I'm Hungarian. Okay. And we get to LAX, which is a great joy if you've never gone. <laughs> it's one of the great experiences that all foreigners get to have. Nothing says welcome to America like LAX. <laughs> of course, she grew up in a home where Baywatch reruns were on. Your view of what an American looks like was a little different than what she saw at LAX. <laughs> Something was true of her as she came into the country that had not been true before. I didn't need to, I didn't even have to, I didn't have to explain that. It's like, this is what's going to happen. You're going to get this. By the way, within about three days of being in America, my mom took them to Disneyland. Not the happiest place on earth for all of us, but anyways, whatever, you, we can fight later. And we were in line at a ride and we'd been on multiple rides and that's when my daughter said, I'm an American, I am American. <laughs> I, I am an American, you know I mean? She was stars and stripes all day at that point. You see, what's true of you is this. You could say all day to me, oh, I'm American, I'm American. Okay, great, yeah, you're American. You are a citizen of heaven if you're in Christ Jesus. If you ain't acting like that, that doesn't change it. It's just ridiculous. Your first priority is the kingdom of God and your citizenship and ambassadorship is in heaven. I'll give a couple examples of what this is gonna look like, what this does look like for you and me as a church. I'm so excited about this new school year. I'm excited about what God's gonna do in our, in our schools. Not just, you know, we have a school here, but then we got all these amazing schools around us and Carlos has been going to multiple high schools around South Bay San Diego and now Daryl and Frankie, some of our staff people, they've been going to these high schools where they have faith clubs. So I'm shout out to faith clubs. If you've got young people in high schools, tell them about it. This year, we have seven different faith clubs on South Bay San Diego high schools. Yeah. There's over 350 kids that go every week. Every week. Some of these clubs have over 100 kids who choose of their own will to go to a, a lunchtime. We feed you. And so people will be like, oh, they're only going for pizza. Why does any youth person go to anything? It's food. It's always been food. Come on. Belly to heart. I believe in that. But they come together. And guess what? This year we get to help coordinate with churches all around the South Bay. Not just us. This is not a Calvary San Diego thing. This is what I'm trying to get at. Not the point of that we get to do these things, but that we get to do this with a whole bunch of other churches that love Jesus in our community. We get to come together and say, let's reach young people. I am, if you want to hear a new narrative, can I please tell you a new narrative? When we're all like, we get that mindset that's like, oh man, we're in trouble. We look around and we go, we are in trouble. Come with us to a faith club. We're not in trouble. We have so much hope. Come to Summer is Ours on Friday night. Watch 600 young people just dancing it up and worshiping Jesus. I have so much hope for our future. I, 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 are we in trouble? Well, according to the book of Revelation, yes, we're going in a direction. But oh my gosh, am I excited about our teenagers and what they're going to, how they're going to um, reach people in the world that they live in is so exciting. May we do a really good job of handing that baton off. It's Olympic season, baby. Just watch all the bloopers of not handing that baton. Ain't nothing worse than a bad handoff. My friends, Christians, we are always in generational handoff. May we do it well. Not just throw it on the ground with a hissy fit of how bad everything is. But may we hand that off. And then you know what they do when they hand it off? They don't go lay on the ground and you know, oh, I'm over. They run along and they watch them and they cheer their team on. I want to cheer my team to the very end. The team that I'm on is the team that's for Jesus. 
2 Corinthians 5.20 says we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. John 17 verse 14, Jesus says, I've given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, but as I do not belong to the world. We're connected to the life of Jesus. We are, we are to be kingdom centered. So when somebody says, yeah, but we need to fix this, we need to fix this state, we need to fix this county, I don't disagree with you. I'm going to do it through kingdom-centeredness. I'm not going to do it apart from kingdom centeredness. I have no problem. I believe in, in, in Christians making an impact in the world that they live in. My, my conduit is going to be kingdom-centeredness. So that it doesn't mean I don't care about anything. I don't care. I'm going to heaven. Nothing matters. Everything matters because, because I'm kingdom-centered. It's just that everything matters in priority. Everything matters in priority. Kingdom-centered. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit on the, on the slides there. Apologies for that. But I'm going to put up a definition of kingdom-centered here. Yeah. It's centering one's priorities, passions, and pursuits around God. Easy phrase, but remember it. This is what it looks like. It's to center priority, passion, and pursuit around God. It means I tear down the, the compartments that we all build up in our lives because God cares about every part of my life. I stop, I don't just live in the, you know, we all have done this, right, when you're like, you know, oh no, guests are coming over and if you've got an upstairs, you just chuck everything up there. Right, because it's like, hey, I don't got time for those things. I get it. Right? But sadly, a lot of us live a Christian life that way where we're like, this is the life, like, Jesus, you get this room. Welcome to this part of my life. You know, Jesus is like, hey, what's upstairs? Let's not go there. And when, you know, and this analogy has been around for decades. Here's the problem with the analogy. You don't own the house. God does. It ain't even your house. You're like, oh, let's let God have the, 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 every room of our house. You don't own the house. You're a tenant in God's kingdom. It's all his. But you know how gracious God is that he's just like, he's like, hey, can I come into this part of your life? No, Lord. Okay, we'll wait. I got eternity. We'll be there. God's so patient and so loving. And then one day you're like, oh, God, would you please come into this part of my life? And he's, he doesn't say, well, I've been waiting. You know what he says? Okay. Let's conquer that area now. Let's get into that area. You see, when we try to describe Christianity like, oh, we got multiple rooms, we need to let God into multiple areas of our lives, it's not a good analogy. It kind of falls apart. Here's where it falls apart. Because you are not multiple different rooms. That's a, that's a multiple personality type of a situation. That's, there's a problem with that, right? You're just one person. The thing is, is as one person, we can hide things, we can identify things, we can, hey, this is me on Sunday, but I got a different life, the rest of, and, and the goal isn't to shame you. Jesus' goal isn't to shame you, but it's to say, I could do something so beautiful in all the other parts if you'll let me into that. That's kingdom-centered. That it's not I have a throne that I should let Jesus come into, but that he has a throne that I just need to keep getting off of. It's not my throne that I need to remove myself from. When we say things like that, like you need to get off the throne and let Jesus on the throne, understand you're getting on his throne. It was never yours in the first place. You don't have a throne. I know that's so hard for us to believe. We have no kingdom. We are a part of a glorious eternal one. And so we must remind ourselves that sometimes we get sneaky, sneaky, and we climb up there on God's throne. And then he's like, hey, let's get off of that. That's not yours. You don't belong there. That's not yours. One of the great gifts that God's given us is that we can live. This is the word that it's, it's we're all familiar with it. But it's, it's a good word for what we're describing we were saved for a, a, it's a, a holistic salvation. Body, soul, spirit, God bless you. 
body, soul, spirit. Your whole, your whole being is meant to be, not just your, like, I learned Bible verses so that'll solve my relational problems. Nope, God wants to get into your relational problems and help you right there. Oh, 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 I got saved, but man, I had such a bad past. I had such a terrible past, but thank God I can just move forward. And then sometimes the Lord's gonna say, no, it's gonna come back and get you. Let's keep working through all that. It's okay. God wants to work through every part of our lives. Heaven is not the great escape. It is the great healing. Heaven is not the great escape. You will not go on an eternal vacation where you leave your problems and never have to look back. Heaven is the great healing where all tears will be wiped away, all pain and all sorrow will be removed. It is not the exclusion of these things, but it is the healing of all hurt forever in our lives. What does it mean to be kingdom-centered? Can I talk about it with what's been going on with the Olympics lately? How many of you know what I'm talking about with what's been happening with, okay, quite a few. Those of you that haven't, you'll, well, spoiler alert, you know. The, so. so, you know, the Olympic ceremony. How many of you like the Olympics, by the way? I'm a, I love the Olympics. I love chips and M&Ms watching the greatest athletes in the world. There's something joyful about that. Run faster. <laughs> I can't believe they only are the fifth fastest person in the world, you know? Past the junk food, you know what I mean? Like, what a terrible human being I am. Okay. So, the, you know, the Olympic ceremony happened, and a lot of people are very upset that it appeared that they had made a, you know, uh, uh, like, a, like a mockery of the Last Supper, and that it was, it was a LGBTQ kind of a, and they did do all those things, by the way. They, they had a whole, like, this table and array of, of what they called um, inclusivity, the inclusivity of the world, 2024, right? And for a lot of Christians, and this is how I didn't get to watch the opening ceremony, but, but, but like every, every, everything started to kind of like the avalanche of, oh my gosh, everybody just started, oh, you can, can you believe this? Can you believe this? Can you believe this? It was all over. Every person and everybody then has to jump on the bandwagon like, I can't believe this mockery of Christianity. Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're saying. And so I want to I wanna be really like as clear as maybe mud. I'll, hopefully I'll be more clear than that. But I want to talk about this because I think it's like a, these like are global moments where we get to actually talk about things that it seems like a lot of people are, you know, kind of angry about and it'd be good to, it'd be good to flesh these things out, right? Especially as it relates to what does it look like to be kingdom centered? And some of you are thinking, oh great, Phil's just going to say we shouldn't even care. And I think we really should care. But I, I would like to suggest that there's avenues for caring that we've missed. I'd like to talk about that a little bit. So a lot of people, so here's the big thing, right? They, they had this LGBTQ kind of table that made it look like Jesus and the disciples, and it's a mockery of Christianity. It's a mockery of the Last Supper. It's a mockery of our faith, and people are upset. People are up in arms, and, and of course, the, uh, yeah, the, it's just a feeding frenzy of how dare they. And I'd like to make a few observations and suggestions the first observation slash suggestion I would like to make, especially as we're talking about kingdom-centeredness, the first one I'd like to make is this. Um, whether it was intentional, I want to get this assumption out of the way. There is an argument that they're saying this had nothing to do with the Last Supper. This was a Greek feast, the Feast of Dionysius. It's a Greek games. This is the Olympics, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's assume the worst case scenario. Can we do that? Let's just assume it. I'm not sure that we should, but let's just do it for the sake of it's Sunday and we like to do it, okay? Let's assume it was an intentional mockery of the Last Supper. What do we as Christians do with that? Well, I want to make the first suggestion. Number one, the Last Supper picture by Leonardo da Vinci is not biblical. It's a Roman Catholic symbol I know this is hard to accept, and you're saying, you're going to say, well, the nuance was they're mocking Christianity. Let's start with first, the French have a real problem with the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not saying that that's right. I'm saying, be very careful before you, like, do you remember in the Bible when God, um, when, the, when the people were being bit by serpents, and then, and then God had them make this serpent, wrapped a bronze serpent wrapped around a pole, and they, everybody that looked at it was healed, it was in the Old Testament, and then a few hundred years later, the people started to worship this thing? The symbol, they started to worship and honor the symbol. And guess what the king did? King Hezekiah took the symbol and he broke it and he crushed it into powder. 
because a symbol had become something it was never meant to be. Friends, I just want to suggest we need to be careful when we make a symbol by a man who was arguably not a Christian who made this. I know I'm stepping on a lot of idols right now. Da Vinci. He painted a picture. They didn't have, they didn't use tables back then. They didn't, be careful of your outrage over a symbol that isn't Christian at all. One. Some of you are like, yeah, but okay, let's keep going. I, I just was starting with the easy one. Let's move on to the next one. And this is a little harder. You ready? There is nothing that the world will ever do to shame Jesus that he hasn't already taken upon himself on the cross. Nothing. He hung on a cross virtually naked. And that story has been told for 2,000 years. It is our salvation. Friends, do not. Oh, how dare they mock Jesus. Dude, you and me are the reason Jesus hung on a cross. Stop with the high and mighty. We have to stop it. The Bible says, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. You think that he's like, you think he's in heaven right now, like, how dare they? He hung on a cross naked for the sins of the world. He let them pull out his beard and crown him with thorns and spit on him. You think a little video, that the, a, a little flashing of some people, and then he's like, oh my gosh, now I'm offended. Where are my people rising up with anger? Guys, he's already taken more shame than the world will ever throw at him. And again, some of you are going to say, yeah, but, okay, all right. I'm on to my third point here. You ready? And then if after this one you still want to be mad, God bless you. I love you. You're welcome. You want to be mad? Hey, I am not happy. I am not happy. I'm with you. I'm not happy that that is the impression that the world would have of Jesus. But I'll tell you what. I haven't been to a Super Bowl on TV where they even talk about Jesus. The whole goal in American sports is to avoid the whole conversation. In French, they're so angry at God, they're still talking about him. Me as a Christian minister, I got opportunities with angry people. I got nothing with lethargic people. I got no open door with people trying to avoid God altogether. But you want to talk about opportunity right now? I guarantee you every European church right now has a great opportunity to say, hey, French, let's talk about why you're so mad. Let's talk about why you're so mad. Why are you so angry? Why has God got you so riled up? And they might say, well, no, we're not mad at God. We're mad at that. Okay, well, then let's talk about that. But you see, what does our sports do? We avoid it altogether. Keep it out altogether. And so here's my third one. Here's my, that was not my third. That was 2B. Okay, here's three. Here's my third one. And I think it's an important one. In fact, a friend of mine has got a book on this. It's a great book. You should, you should read it. Or you, an audible. I'm sure he's got an audible version of it. It's called Christians in the Age of Outrage. Came out during COVID. Apropos, isn't it? I, I want to suggest something that concerns me. Forget the, forget the, the blatant disregard and kind of the, a mockery of Christianity. Let's just take it for what it is. It's a mockery. Okay. What concerns me, my concern is not like I don't, yeah, here's my concern. Jesus said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Right? You know what concerns me right now is what's in the hearts of most of God's people. You know what's not in the heart of most people? We're not seeing an explosion of joy around the world. For, forget this moment. Just take any other moment. It's very rare that we see explosions of joy. Just a, just a, 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 just a burst of love and life and happiness and, like, and hope and peace. No, 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 that's all bottled up in the safety of our cute little churches. But I tell you what, somebody mocks what we believe is so important to us, and guess what comes out of us? Rage. Something is wrong when believers are so filled with rage. You don't like it, then don't like it. I agree with you. I'm kind of bothered by it. I don't like that that happened. So then what's my response? I am outraged at the word. You know what I hear? I hear Christians using words like disgusting. And let me just tell you, like, let me use, uh, 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 I'm going to use Nick. Nick and I as an example. Nick, he's my guy, so we're good. We're good, okay? Imagine, you know, if Nick came, I'll, I'll, I'll be the guy. Nick comes to me and he's like, you know what, Phil? You disgust me. 
I feel like we don't have a good relationship. Am I fair in that assumption? I feel like if I'm hurting, Nick won't be the one I'm calling. Anybody agree with that right there? He may not be first call. He may not be on the list at all. Guys, I know we think that it's just online. It doesn't really matter. But most of your people only see you online. So rein in the outrage and ask yourself, why am I so angry? What is it inside of me that is so angry about a symbol drawn by a theist representing a false concept of the Lord's Supper. Hey, people have been mocking Jesus for 2,000 years. He said, the world hates me and they will hate you. I don't know what part of that we've missed. Why are we thinking like, how dare they? What, how dare they do exactly what Jesus said they would do? Do you think outrage in that direction is going to reach anybody. Is your goal to make sure they know that they are the enemy or is your goal to do so much damage to the real enemy that you subversively reach those people? You know what's the greatest, greatest, oh my gosh, you know what would do the greatest damage to hell and to the devil is that if we were to love the very people he's trying to get us to hate. You can stick it, devil. We're going to love those people. Because somehow we started to believe they're the enemy. Friends, you don't have human enemies. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers in heavenly places. Our enemy is the devil. And he wants you to think, he wants me to think Nick is my enemy. He wants me to think you're my enemy. He wants me to think that when you don't reach out to me when I'm hurting, you're the enemy. He wants me to think that because those people put on a, a, a display of worldliness, that they're the enemy. They are not my enemy. They are lost people. Are they wrong? Who, baby, yes. Is that expression a mockery? Yes. But I have discovered, and now you're going to have to just believe me. I can't prove this, but I, I need you to believe me, and I'm done screaming at you. Okay? Here it is. You have to believe me. Decades of evangelistic experience, you have to believe me. A person who is angry at God is closer than a person who just doesn't care. You have to believe me. There is a collective mockery of God, and that immediately in my mind tells me, ooh, the Lord's going to do something in the French people. God's going to do, you know there's never been revival in France? Reformation killed them all. There's never been a revival. Why would I not want there to be one? They're not my enemy. Are they wrong? Is it, is it, is it a foul expression of my Christian faith? Absolutely. Nobody's arguing that. But this, if my heart is full of so much outrage, I gotta wonder, where's my joy? Where's my peace? Where's my hope? Where's the explosion of happiness? Where's the explosion of flourishing? Where's the explosion of joy? There's no room because my heart's just bubbling with anger at the world. And I'm just waiting for a moment when I can say, I just hate these people. And then what? Do I feel better? Did I reach anybody? Did anything get accomplished? Zero. A big, giant, fat zero. You know what happens? The same people who are also hateful agree with you. Again, I'm not thinking of any of you in this context. Is it a despicable expression of Christianity? Of course it is. But Jesus already said this is the reality. And he already took more shame than anything the world will throw at him. So we have got to let it go and get back to the mission that God put us on, which is to put his kingdom first above all things. Thank you. I believe that the world is against God. I believe it with all my heart. I know it to be true. I'm gonna, again, just using example to say I, I might know it in ways that until you've been sharing your faith with people in a direct kind of way, you just don't even know it. Until you're in that direct kind of line of fire, you just don't even, I know, I, the world is against God. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> it's not that. That's exactly why we're here. Don't forget that. That is why you are here. 
They're, they are not friends with God. Shoot, I just became a friend with God 30 some odd years ago. Before that, I was his enemy. And I still do things that make me go, my gosh, I thought I was better than that. Anybody else do that? So friends, reign it, hold it. There's better things out there for you and me. If everyone else wants to shout their rage, how cool would it be for a group of people to say, man, we're sorry you feel that way about Jesus. He's better than that. He's better. And then every mockery and every anger and every frustration that they pour, we just absorb it and we say, man, I'm so sorry you're hurt. You think it's powerful to rage against the machine? It just makes you a follower. You are a kingdom citizen. We are called to be better and greater and holier and an explosion of love and joy. And I believe that the greatest damage we will do to the kingdom of hell is reach those very people that he's made his ambassadors for evil. Do you have any, I'm gonna invite the worship team out because if you all don't come back out, I'll never stop. So Adam, come on out here. John was quick, he jumped up right there. He's like, shoot. <laughs> If the world is supposed to be on sides, let's be clear then. The sides are not against people, it's against the devil. Just see it, you just gotta see it for that. And then in that way, you and I won't see people as our enemy. They're conduits of evil. They are not themselves lost and doomed until they enter into eternity and God says it's so. And until that day, they're just open, that's an open field for us. And to be kingdom-centered, I would like to suggest something to you. We love to fish in ponds where we feel like it'll be easy, but wouldn't it be, isn't it great glory to God if we fish in difficult ponds and difficult water and God redeems? That one lost person that comes to Christ, what does the Bible say? There is rejoicing in all of heaven. So friends, let's not let the rage feel vindicated. By the way, I got one last point to that one, four. But Jesus expressed rage when he was throwing over tables and whipping people. You're right, guess where he was? He was in the house of God. He wasn't in the world doing that. Two times the Bible tells us when Jesus got angry, guess who those two groups of people were? Religious leaders, and you ready? This one hurts, this one hurts so bad, his disciples. The two times Jesus expressed anger was to the Jews that should have known better and to the disciples. And you know why he got mad at the disciples? Because they were trying to keep people from Jesus. They were trying to keep people from Jesus and Jesus, the Bible tells it, it doesn't say it clear in English, but it's very clear in the original language. He was angry at that. Friends, I'm, I, let us be angry at the things that are keeping people from God. Not the people themselves, but the system and the, and the evil and the, and the sin of this world that's holding people back. Stop caring about the wrong things. I wanna do it and I want you to do it with me. I'm off my soapbox, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege today to get to talk about kingdom-centeredness and intentionality. And Lord, as we close in worship, we just say, Lord, we want to, we want to um, exemplify an explosion of joy and confidence and faith in the person of Jesus Christ. You are the only hope of this world. It is very evident this world is lost. You are the only hope. <laughs> and so Lord, may you use us to bring your kingdom into very dark spaces. You reached into our hearts and you could use us to reach into others for your glory, for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us, whether online or in person. We pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is encouraging you in your faith. If you would like to follow along with what we are doing, 
or hear more teachings, you can do so by downloading the Calvary SD mobile or TV app. Also, if you would like to partner with us and worship through giving, you can do so at calvarysd.com give. Thanks for tuning in.